Hey guys, this is Delise, and we are back with another episode of Married to Myself. This is episode 9, Pollo Means Chicken. I advertised this title on my social media, and for those of you that follow me, you may be wondering, what in the world is this episode going to be about that is such a random and strange title, and I'm so excited to get into it. Um, It has been a week since the argument over pollo. (laughs) <laughs> husband and I were in a restaurant. Um, I'll get into that. Let me give you a quick intro. This podcast is about marriage and the arguments that we have in marriage and how to use those arguments as a window um, into a deeper psychological and or spiritual um, issue and it, how to reveal what those issues might be based on the arguments that you're having, especially those arguments that happen Repeatedly, I have been married for 24 years. It'll be 25 years coming up in March. This podcast is being recorded October 4th of 2023, and I will have been married 25 years, um, March 2024. And we have been together 27 years, so almost 30 years. This podcast called Married to Myself is dealing with what it takes for you by yourself to work on improving your marriage and reducing the amount of arguments that you have, the way that you see those arguments and the way that you use those arguments to grow and reflect on who you are and what some of your baggage is and what things you need to change about who you are. And I say you, you, and you, and called it married to myself because as long as you are focused on the other person, all the things they have done to you, all the things they are doing wrong, you will continue to struggle because you can only um, change you. You can only control you. You are the factor in the relationship that you can actually do something about. You can talk to your blue in the face, as I'm sure a lot of you can relate with, about and to the other person and what you'd like them to change. But heaven knows nothing's changing until you do. So that's why I call this podcast Married to Myself. Let's get into Pollo Means Chicken. So last week, my husband and I went to um, one of our favorite restaurants that we frequent quite often called Machetes, and it is a taco spot that has a few locations um, in Colorado. Really good tacos, by the way, if you ever plan to check it out. We were beginning to order our food, and he asked me a question about um, the word, and he's like, you know, how do you pronounce this again? I think I want the chicken taco, and I said, it's pollo, and he says, I see polo, and I was like, oh yeah, I see that. Well, polo has one L. Um, And I proceeded to explain how in Spanish, the grammar rule of whenever you see a double L, it's actually pronounced like a Y. And as I was saying that, those exact words, he started talking over me kind of loud, kind of sharp and um, defensive like something to the effect of I'm not going to remember that. And it raised a red flag, but not enough for me to realize that I was hitting a button with him. Even though I'm aware of this button, I wasn't identifying it as that button. So I continued to proceed, becoming more uncomfortable as he was becoming more uncomfortable um, as I proceeded to talk. So the next thing that I proceeded to say was something to the effect of, um, you don't say uh tortilla you say tortilla and in that word it's the double l and i'm saying all of this um with excitement because i'm actually studying spanish so that had been a topic that it just you know gotten reviewed and i was sharing with him what i had been learning and he got even more defensive and even more stern. And he was like, I don't learn that way. I'm not going to remember that. And like he's talking over me as I'm saying these things about what I've learned or what have you. And I'm getting frustrated and he's getting more frustrated. And I'm like, and I, in my subconscious, I'm saying, or I guess I should say my conscious because I recall actually thinking this. What is happening? Why is he getting defensive? I'm just shooting the breeze about how to order his chicken tacos in a Spanish restaurant. And so it goes 
on, and I probably say five sentences, and he probably says five sentences on top of mine, trying to stop me from teaching him about pronouncing pollo in Spanish. And so then I stopped talking about it, and I addressed that he just got really loud and defensive and weird, and what is going on? Like, what... Did I miss something? Did I say something before we got here that made you upset and I I didn't catch it until now where we're having this mundane conversation about how to pronounce chicken in Spanish? And he answered me and let me know that I know that he hates reading and grammar and spelling and that that's not his cup of tea and why would I even attempt to have that conversation with him? And I was like, whoa. (laughs) I So this sounds really petty, right? But just... Hear me out and you'll be able to compare this to maybe a conversation, an argument that you've had and see how we were able to reflect on actually how deep this goes and in, in, um, resolve some deeper issues in our marriage. So as this might be really irritating to listen to, <laughs> as it is for me to even repeat because it just seemed so silly in the moment, it actually ended up being very um, impactful um, when we were able to dig into what was happening. Um So, (laughs) a side note, just referring to something as an argument as opposed to a disagreement, depending on who you are and what your baggage is, what your history is with relationships, could also put more pressure on the way you're handling your disagreements, Um, depending on the level of maturity your relationship is in i.e. are you in first grade, second grade, are you in middle school, are you in high school, and then what grade of middle school and high school are you in, are you in college? Um, Those references go back to the book that I wrote called Growing Into a Mature Marriage from Kindergarten to College, where I compare the different maturity levels to the maturity levels and social interactions of school. So with that being said, if you are in middle school, high school in your marriage, you're probably or hopefully not having arguments anymore, but you're having disagreements. In the restaurant, my husband and I were having a disagreement and an argument would have been, by my definition, noticeable by the people around us in the restaurant because that would have made them uncomfortable. We would have been yelling, maybe being disrespectful to each other, um, body language that would indicate that there's something wrong and that we're um, at odds with each other. Whereas we have learned to have disagreements where we can be in total um, disagreement (laughs) with each other um, and not and go undetected in public um, that we're even having a disagreement because maybe we're still smiling or we're keeping a straight face or we just like we're having a serious conversation, but it's not something where the surrounding people are now like wanting to call the police because they feel unsafe or feel unsafe for either of you. So by my definition and by the progression of the maturity of my relationship, that would be the difference between an argument and a disagreement. So technically this was a disagreement. We didn't disrespect each other. We didn't call each other out of each other's names and no one around us. And it was a very, close quarters of a restaurant no one uh sitting around us felt the need to call the police or come over and say are you okay or or us be asked to leave the restaurant so um that's for you to determine you know where you are in your relationship are you still arguing or are you at the level of disagreeing and there's no judgment there regardless of where you are because I definitely started off in the argument phase and was there for the majority of my my marriage and worked very hard to get to the to the disagreement stage and now that I'm at the disagreement stage I have to remind myself that although I have this feeling that I've paid my dues to the point where there should not be any more disagreements um, especially not any arguments because I feel so worn out or tired when they do come up, even though it is seldom, I've had to realize, and I talked to, um, I was talking to a therapist about it today, that it is very unrealistic to ever think that you're going to get to a point where there are no 
disagreements. There are going to be disagreements um, until the day you die. <laughs> you can be married for 60 years, which is probable in my husband, in my case, because we got married so young. We've been married, um, as I mentioned, uh, going on 26 years, and we're only 40 years old. I'm 40. He's 41. Um, so there will always be disagreements. It's just a matter of how you view them and your perception of it and what you do with it and how you use it to level up and move on to the next grade. So don't be like me and get discouraged every time you disagree because that will really wear you out um, and age you, <laughs> age your heart at least, um, even if you still look 17 on the outside. Um, as I do. <laughs> um, so back to the argument and what was revealed um, from the argument. So after the five sentences came out of my mouth and his were kind of being thrown back at me before I could even get mine out of my mouth, I immediately started to address the energy and that it had, it had changed and what was going on. And he started to explain um, he said, hey, I'm not mad. I just don't want to talk about reading and writing and grammar. And I was like, okay, I wasn't trying to teach you. I'm sorry, because I do know, as I mentioned, that that's a hot button for him. And he said, yeah, you, you know, I hate teachers. And, and I said, I know that you do. And I wasn't trying to teach you. I, you had asked a question. He's like, well, I don't want to be given the rules to the language. I want to be told the answer. And going back to give you guys some backstory, that was a big gripe that he had with teachers, you know, from from elementary school all the way through high school is that instead of giving the answer, they'll say, well, you don't know how to spell uh, dinosaur, go get a dictionary and look it up. And from his perspective, really struggling with um, spelling and phonics and writing and reading and maybe even dyslexia, his thought was, how in the world is a dictionary going to help me if I can't spell? <laughs> and that makes a lot of sense. So I, I empathize with that. So anyway, he was looking at me like I was being one of those teachers, right? Because I started giving a grammatical rule to a language um, that he could care less to learn how to s speak or read or, or understand the grammar of because he can speak our language but cannot uh, read or write it well at all. So I totally empathize with that. And I have my um, academic areas that I have are uh, touchy, hot button issues for me because I have emotional trauma over those academic um, areas um, because of how hard it was for me to process and um, understand and comprehend that subject with math. I'm talking about math um, in school. So totally get it. And we've always used that to relate to each other. Like, hey, you are terrible at math and you are terrible at reading. Let's be each other's strength in those areas. You know, that's perfect. Like two puzzle pieces coming, coming together. So I'm upset because I know that it's a hot button issue, but that's not what I was trying to do. I was not trying to teach him. I was just sharing and really just shooting the breeze because we just needed something to talk about. And we were looking at the menu and talking about Spanish. So after we argue about it through the entire meal as to why he's being defensive, I'm upset that he feels the need to even defend himself against me because I'm not the enemy. We're on the same team, right? I'm your friend. I'm your best friend. Why do you think you have to defend yourself against me? And he was making all of his points we got into the car, and we continued to discuss. And when I got in the car, I said, I apologize that this conversation slash disagreement slash argument, whatever you want to call it, is still going on because this is draining, but I just want to have some resolution. And so he responded and said a few things, and I apologize. I can't remember everything he said. I just remember the resolutions that we came to. And he would be on here speaking for himself, but... Um, he doesn't really like doing podcasts, <laughs> which is totally cool. Um, I like it, so this is my thing. Um, so anyway, um, the 
I said, oh, you were defending and protecting your inner child, your inner little boy. And he said, yes, I was totally doing that. And I will always do that when it comes to people trying to teach him how to read. And I said, I know that already about you. And I apologize. It wasn't my intention to teach you how to read. I was more so excited about what I was learning and trying to share with you what I had learned because it is my inner child that wants to teach and be listened to and be heard. And that was the moment where we had an amazing breakthrough and also realized some trauma bonding that attracted us to each other probably way back in the 90s when we originally came together, right? Um, I felt as a child unheard and not listened to and interrupted every time I tried to communicate probably wanted to feel some level of importance where I could share and teach. Ha <laughs> ha, hence I'm here sharing and teaching with you um, how to get through your marriage arguments. <laughs> um, and his inner child huh, wanted to be protected from the style of teaching that comes through in most um, American classrooms, the academia mindset um, as opposed to like more of a Montessori type of teaching where you're hands on and you're outdoors and you discover what that child's genius, inner genius is and then cater to that so that they don't feel um, dumb, um, to put it plainly, which him and I both suffered from that. I felt dumb in school because I just didn't comprehend and really struggled with math. And then, you know, he felt that way when it came to uh, reading. So we both identified something about ourselves in that we had trauma bonded with, I don't like teachers. Um, I never want to be taught again with regards to this subject specifically. And me, I can't wait to be heard and to teach something and to help people you know, level up and understand something that I've been through and not have to go through the pain that I've gone through. Um, I look forward to sharing that and enlightening people. And so that trauma bonded us. His trauma, I don't like teachers. My trauma, I really want to teach. <laughs> and that right there, if you can't relate to this specific argument, if you don't compartmentalize the details, but you look at the broad picture is something that really <laughs> resonates through many, many relationships um, because I have been an ear for many, many relationships prior to writing my book, um, during writing my book, after that people have come together with opposite uh, traumas that really connect them together like puzzle pieces and then they proceed to torment each other for as many years as they do not deal with what those traumas were. <laughs> and I laugh. Um, on one hand, it's heavy and disheartening and frustrating and relationships are hard and all of that. And on the other hand, we have to laugh our way through life or you won't make it. <laughs> your marriage won't make it. Um, whatever challenge, whatever you're working to get through, won't make it if you can't also um, laugh at it and, and make it light and then count all of your blessings. Another sidebar here, the notes that I've made to make this podcast are in a this really beautiful notebook, and it's a themed Disney notebook, and the notebook is uh, Cinderella's notebook, and it has this beautiful like gold clasp and this leather it's leather bound and it's got gold leafing and it really took me back to my childhood because um, I grew up on Disney fantasy movies and when I saw this cover I was it just took me there um, I was at Disney World with my adult kids my son and my daughter-in-law and I said I'm not buying any Disney stuff I don't wear clothes with Disney stuff on it even though I have you know a place in my heart for the movies that spoke to me as a child and gave me the fantasies that I had about marriage and relationships. But I say all that to say, I'm looking at my notes and in every corner of every page, it's Cinderella with her glass slipper missing 
and then the glass slippers up in the other corner of the notebook. Um, and the point I want to make there is if you grew up like me with this fantasy about what marriage should look like based on all the fantasies that were that you were impossibly indoctrinated with, um, you want to definitely have a standard for who you're going to start this journey with if, if you haven't gotten married yet. And if you are married, be encouraged um, that if you're with someone who also wants to make it work and stay with you no matter what to figure out all of the arguments, <laughs> all the disagreements, then you have uh, Prince Charming slash Cinderella material. Um, but fantasy is just that. It's a fantasy. And you don't start off with Prince Charming. You have to build him through uh, changing who you are. And vice versa, if you're a husband out there listening to this, you don't start off with Cinderella. You start off with the material of Cinderella, the essence of Cinderella, the potential of Cinderella, and then you build her um, through respect, love, encouragement, and working on yourself so that she can have room to work on herself and and vice versa. And so don't get caught up in the fantasy, but definitely start with good material because if you start off with bad material, just someone completely broken, disrespectful, um, you have to learn how to look for those things in the dating phase. Um, someone that gaslights you when you say you feel a certain way, um, someone who, um, just a narcissist. And if you don't know what that word means, look up the word narcissist. Um, because those people are typically drawn toward, um, empaths <laughs> and empaths are people who really take on the emotions of other people, um, really feel for other people and then start to feel other people's emotions. And unfortunately the trauma bonding there is they will connect to someone who takes advantage of that personality. So Cinderella and Prince Charming are a fantasy. Don't have unrealistic expectations, but definitely start with good material so that you have something to build on. And there's so many resources out there for premarital counseling and um, therapy as an individual. But I definitely, if you are married, would suggest doing therapy anyway. And if you are married to someone that doesn't want to do couples therapy, that is not an excuse for you to give up. Do therapy, self-therapy. Um, and there's so many resources out there, regardless of your income bracket. There's books, there's Facebook groups that are actually beneficial. Um, you don't have to read comments that are negative, but you can read the, the posts um, following if you are a Christian, you know, Christian groups and biblical based groups. That's the belief that I um, was raised in and that's my foundation and that's the advice that I look for and it has been the advice that has helped us to flourish is biblical principle. So we get in the car and I say, oh my gosh, your little boy is defending himself. You were like back in the classroom when I started explaining how to say pollo and he agreed with me and said, yes, you're right. And I will, I will defend him to the day that I die. And what I did in that moment was for a split second, I started to want to address how we could heal that little boy and how he needed to forgive his teachers from, from elementary, middle school and high school. And then I stopped and I was like, no, my own principle following my own advice is that you can point something out you can find a respectful and loving way to address the issue, but then it's your job to work on yourself. And so I said, okay, well, why was I so insistent upon continuing to get my words out in the restaurant instead of just stopping at the first sign that I was um, offending him? Why didn't I just stop talking about Pollo? One, I didn't recognize that, that that was a true issue. I thought maybe something else was going on and I hadn't identified it, but that led me back to me and me working on me. And do you know what I realized? I realized, oh, that's my inner little girl 
that wants to teach and lead and guide and help and heal. And when it's not welcomed, I need to stop. So great position for me to be in with a podcast because you have the option to listen or to stop or to find a whole nother podcast to listen to that might help you um, work through your stuff because there's a teacher out there for everyone and I am not everyone's teacher. And in your marriage, you may have to come to the harsh reality that you are not your spouse's teacher. (laughs) Um, In my book, Growing into a Mature Marriage from Kindergarten to College, one of the main themes is that we are each other's teacher, um, directly or indirectly, because being with the person you're going to spend the rest of your life with, there's a lot to learn about them and about yourself. Um, so therefore you become a teacher. Um, and in some relationships you can directly teach each other and it's not taken offensively in other relationships. You can't all based on the baggage and what things you need to work through. Um, so I, after 25 years of marriage realized something about my inner little girl and I hadn't even acknowledged that there was a inner little girl prior to that conversation and that's 25 years into a marriage guys so be encouraged that we're consistently growing and learning and changing and that you should be consistently growing and learning and changing because if you're sitting still if you're sitting stagnant um you're dying you're not you're not living you're not growing so here's another tip um to start tracking your arguments my husband and I used to when we had our arguments, we used to say, man, I wish we were being recorded because we would have arguments about what we argued about and say, that's not what you said. No, I said this. Or you mean that's not what you meant. No, that's not what I meant, but that's what I said. Or that's what I meant, but that's not what I said. And then it feels like you're getting nowhere because you can't even remember what you're arguing about because now you're arguing about what you did or didn't say instead of arguing about the original conversation. That is extremely frustrating and feels like you're spinning your wheels in the mud because you are. And so if you start to keep a journal, which I would advise um, about the arguments that you have and just make some bullet points, it doesn't have to be extensive and take up hours of your time. But if you're tired of arguing and you're sick of tired of being tired, I know that you'll take um, whatever action necessary out of desperation (laughs) to start to um, find some resolution. So tracking your arguments or your disagreements will allow you to see patterns over time and that will start to reveal underlying issues. And a lot of our issues um, come back to fears, insecurities, and then you can start to see what your triggers are. And then you can communicate to your spouse what your triggers are so that you can work through not triggering each other and being more empathetic and sympathetic to your triggers and understanding why those triggers are there Um, and then not pushing each other's buttons identifying triggers leads to self-awareness arguments can trigger intense emotions Uh, self-reflection to reflect on your own reactions during an argument is so helpful and that's what happened when we got in the car after I pointed the finger at him and said oh your little boy this and that I realized oh, wow, I was reacting to you, reacting to me, trying to teach you instead of just shutting up and observing the situation from, like, the outside. And that is something you can do. Even though you are the person in the disagreement with your spouse, you can stop and put yourself in a therapist position and kind of look at yourself from outside of yourself and say, what am I doing right now? Let me stop. Let me slow down. I don't need to defend. I don't need to be right. I don't need to argue. I just need to be quiet for a second and process what is happening in this moment. And that can save you from having a lot of heated arguments by just stopping. And you could come back to it later. You can stop and think and then completely redirect yourself. Had I stopped in that moment of explaining boil means chicken and this is how you pronounce it and two L's in Spanish just sounds like a yeah. And as he's putting up these um, blockers, you know, as I'm saying each thing, I could have stopped on the first sentence when he threw up his first verbal blocker to say, I don't want this from you. Um, But instead of jumping outside of myself to observe us, I 
burrowed deeper within myself and my little girl started yelling and screaming and his little boy was yelling and screaming and I don't mean that literally because we weren't yelling and screaming um but we were definitely acting out because it was it was crazy in my opinion it was crazy because I'm like man at this point in our relationship can we just not disagree at all about anything (laughs) and that's just me being 100% authentic um with you guys again I know that that is not realistic and not a healthy thought it is just me venting to you hoping that that gives you some relief (laughs) <laughs> and it allows you to vent um, as you listen to this. Just vent out some something that maybe you've been holding on to. Self-awareness is essential to addressing deeper issues. And I had to have that moment of self-awareness once we got into the car after our heated dinner. Um, active listening and empathy. Um, listening to each other and really empathizing, like really feeling where that person is coming from instead of trying to be heard and defend your point. Trying to be heard and defend your point is a never-ending battle because the the other person is just trying to be heard and defend their point. But as soon as you become an active listener and can re like reverberate what they've said to you and what you think they're trying to say and how that makes them feel, then they feel heard and then that can be reciprocated. And it takes time, so don't be frustrated if you you take that step to say. I feel like you're saying this, and I apologize that it went that way. And you have this really professional and empathetic response, and then they're still being the immature one. Don't give up. It takes some time. And a lot of times, most of the time, one person has to be more mature than the other person. That's how you grow your relationship. Don't look at that as a negative. Like, I'm always the one being more mature. That's just how it works. And then eventually that other person hopefully will catch up if you have started with good material. Empathy can uncover hidden feelings and emotions and seeking professional help, like I mentioned, through uh, groups, through church. If um, it's in your budget to have a a therapist, um, they come at different levels of, um, you know, based on your financial ability. But there are free resources and very inexpensive resources like books. And of course, I'll mention my book again. It's on Amazon, Growing into a Mature Marriage from Kindergarten to College by Delise Collins. So if you record your um, disagreements, just, you know, some bullet points so that you can start to track what you are consistently coming back to. And if you stay in a relationship long enough, you will be circling back to the same arguments over and over again. I'm sure you can relate to that. Um, (laughs) uh, And by recording it, you can... It reveals a lot. Writing things down is very powerful. And you will get further faster by writing down the arguments that you're having as opposed to having them. And then next time you have it saying, do you remember we had this argument before and you said this and I said that? And now you're arguing about what was said. No, I didn't say that. You said this and I said that. Just write it down. Um, I now... After so many years of joking about wishing we had a recorder while we were arguing so we could go back and reference what was actually said, by default, our argue, a lot of our arguments are recorded because we own a business together and there's uh, cameras re- recording um, 24-7 at our business. So now, not intentionally, but by default, if we argue at work, it is on camera. <laughs> And I'll save that for next week's episode, but we did have a disagreement today that we were able to pull tape, (laughs) go back and watch game tape and review what had happened and what went wrong and why we keep coming back to that argument. And that'll be next week's podcast. Um, And I think I'm going to call that one, uh, Don't Talk to Me Like That. (laughs) Uh, So couples therapy, counseling, coaching, Look for the resources, um, reading books, realizing that ego cannot be present in your conversations. You can't get to the bottom of those reoccurring arguments without humility and vulnerability. And that means you just got to let the ego go. And that's easier said than done, I'd say, in the beginning of a relationship because you are more guarded in the beginning, you're learning how to trust, you're still protecting yourself, 
shoot, as I just explained, we're 25 years in and still protecting, you know, our inner, inner child, our inner traumatized child. But realizing sooner than later that ego has to go, you will not hit those reoccurring arguments as often and you'll be able to, through vulnerability, really hit the root of why you're having particular arguments and why certain things are hot button issues and why it's getting so emotional. And you want that. You want to get there sooner than later because nobody likes to argue. I say that, but I used to say my husband loves to argue. Um, That'll be another podcast. So all of these tips lead to healthy conflict resolution where you are just talking like two civilized adults, sharing your past, your trauma, what marriage looked like when you were a child, if you had married or divorced parents, the ideas that that formed in you, the traumas that were created in your life as a child, and then as a teenager, and then as an adult, especially if you have previous marriages, previous relationships, because those are all affecting the relationship you're in now. And those need to be things that you can bring to the table and talk about. And if you're not in a relationship where the level of maturity allows you to discuss those things, just write them down and journal them because just putting them out on paper can allow you through through that ritual of getting it out if you don't have someone to talk to, um, to still find ways to heal, recover, and change the way you are reacting to your spouse so that you can start responding as opposed to reacting out of emotion, but respond out of well thought out strategic planning like you're playing chess um so i'm gonna wrap this up pollo means chicken (laughs) learn your spouse's hot buttons learn your own and heal and you are where healing starts for you no one else can heal you but you um I'm here to help facilitate that process by pointing things out and giving you another way to look at things and by being vulnerable and open to share the arguments that I have with my husband. After being together for 27 years and being completely fed up with the arguments that occur so frequently, um, less frequently now, I don't want to discourage you guys, much less frequently now, I have written a book to write it down, right? The power of writing it down to heal and to help other people not have to go through what I went through and get to that place of peace sooner. And now I am doing this podcast <laughs> and I'm hoping that it reaches the people it is intended to reach so that you can get to the place of peace And the place of having disagreements instead of having arguments much sooner than I arrived at that place of maturity. The book is called Growing into a Mature Marriage from Kindergarten to College by Delise Collins. It is available on Amazon. Please get it, read it, leave a review, good, bad, or indifferent. May you all be blessed. May you learn something about who you are and improve your marriage. And remember, the mature marriage was once a sloppy, hot, immature mess. We all have to start somewhere. Love yourself so that you can love each other. I love you, and I'll talk to you guys on the next one. Thank you so much for listening.